and welcome to TEPSA Explainers. I'm Tatjana Kuhn and I'm a research associate at CIF in Berlin. In today's video I'm going to talk about the joint communication of the European Commission called the EU and Central Asia, new opportunities for a stronger partnership. It has been published by the European Commission of 15th May this year and still needs to be ratified by the European Parliament and the European Council. There is one main point that I would like you to take today from this video. Forecasts predicting that the new EU Central Asia strategy would be based on EU's pragmatic interests rather than on EU norms, such as human rights and the rule of law, cannot be affirmed. Next to some new priority areas such as migration and mobility, climate change and sustainable connectivity, the norm-oriented goals from the old strategy can still be found in the new document even though in a different wording. The first EU Central Asia strategy was created in 2007. It was formulated at a time where the European Union saw potential for a most, more focused strategic cooperation with the five Central Asian states – Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan. These had become independent after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991 and were seeking closer connections with the EU, especially in the area of trade, energy and cultural exchange. When the strategy was formulated in 2007, the idea of the normative power Europe was still very vivid, so that the strategy included sentences such as the EU will pursue its objectives of ensuring the promotion and protection of human rights throughout the world. Indeed, the document had a double nature. It was partly based on EU interests, such as energy security, trade, and partly on EU norms and values, such as human rights and democracy promotion. And although exchange on the latter was established through the high-level human rights dialogue and the rule of law initiative, Central Asian states remained rather skeptical of the normative agenda. This is partly to do with the fact that Russia's influence is very strong in Central Asia throughout widespread consumption of Russian mass media. Under these circumstances, the new EU Central Asia strategy had to be composed more cautiously, taking into account the cultural sensitivities as well as the geopolitical situation in Central Asia, with China's growing economic presence in the region and Russia's economic and political interests. This caution, however, did not lead to the exclusion of the normative dimension from the new strategy. The first part of the document, called Partnering for Resilience, clearly states that, as its first aim, there is the promotion of international standards, such as the freedom of expression, women's rights, the rights of minorities, and so on. These shall be encouraged in the collaboration framework of UN bodies, agencies, and fora, such as the Good Human Rights Stories Initiative, the Spotlight Initiative, and others. Furthermore, the new strategy addresses the engagement of civil society in parliaments as a goal in part three of the document. There is the idea to establish an EU Central Asia Forum, which shall regularly bring together representatives of civil society, academics, and think tankers from the EU and Central Asia. All in all, the prediction that the EU is steering towards a new so-called principal pragmatism era cannot be validated with regard to the new EU Central Asia strategy. Although themes such as border security, energy cooperation, trade, and so on remain important, they are not presented as higher ranking over EU's value-oriented goals. It now remains to be seen to what extent and in which way the ideas inherent in the strategy can be implemented and will be supported by the Central Asian partners. So I hope you found this video very insightful. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next Tapsa Explainer. Thank you.